Welcome, grade 12 learners, geography learners specifically, in our review of Geography Paper 1's exam guidelines. Today we'll be giving you an overview of the expectations for Geography Paper 1. Remember, this is about physical geography. Yes, climate and weather, geomorphology, as well as map work and the application of all those physical geography components on a topographical map. For today's lesson, remember, we are looking at the breakup of this particular examination. Question one is climate and weather. Question two, geomorphology. Question three, geographical skills and techniques. Remember, in geography paper one, all questions are compulsory. Let's take a closer look at the format and structure of geography paper one. Note that in paper one, question one is climate and weather, and that is accounting for 60 marks of the total marks in this paper. Question two, geomorphology, 60 marks again. And question three, which is your geographical skills and techniques made up of map skills, topographic maps, aerial photographs and orthophoto maps, as well as geographical information systems for a total of 30 marks which means that Geography Paper 1 is 150 marks and the time allocation is 3 hours. Let's take a closer look at what kind of content is being examinable in this particular exam paper. Note that in Question 1, Climate and Weather, the following topics are relevant to your studies. Mid-latitude cyclones, tropical cyclones, subtropical anticyclones and remember here we're talking about your three high pressure systems the south atlantic high the kalahari high as well as the correct south indian high as well as valley climates and urban climates in question two which focuses on geomorphology the content that is relevant to this particular question is drainage systems in south africa fluvial processes and catchment and river management of course, within these broader topics, there are various subtopics which we'll be discussing in detail later on in the show. And of course, question three, geographical skills and techniques made up of map work techniques. You know what I'm talking about, all your calculations, aerial photo and orthophoto maps. Here we're looking at the application of physical geography on your topographical map as well as orthophoto map. And of course, geographical information systems. Again, the application of all your GIS concepts from the topographical map and the content knowledge that you have in question three. Let's take a closer look at the structure of this particular question paper. Remember, we've already established that it's made up of 60 marks per question. Let's look at those 60 marks in detail. So there are two short questions or short item questions made up of seven and eight marks. This gives you a total of 15 marks. There are three long item questions or questions that will be utilizing resources, a variety of resources. Those three long questions make up 15 times three marks, which is 45 marks. So you have a total of 45 marks on three longer questions and 15 marks on two short item questions, giving you a total of 60. In question two, again geomorphology, remember again two short item questions, that's one seven and one eight mark question, make up 15 marks, not the 25 that you see on your screens. There are three long item questions, again using a variety of resources, made up of three times 15 mark questions, giving you a total of 45. Hence the total for question two is 60 marks. When it comes to geographical skills and techniques or map work, your map work calculations are made up of 20 marks, your map work applications are made up of 12 marks, and GIS made up of 8 marks, giving you a total for question 3 of 30. Hence, the total for this examination is 150. Now, let's look at strategies in handling this particular examination. Note. These are the tips that you should be incorporating in your studies in preparation for paper one. The most important aspect of a three hour 
a two hour, a one and a half hour, or any examination is time management. You have to draw on all your content knowledge in the specifically allotted time to complete this examination. So time management is very important in any examination. You have to determine how long you spend on the different types of cognitive verbs in a question paper. Remember, remembering is a type of question or the recalling of information. Understanding, defining concepts, as well as application. You should be saving more time for those longer type of questions and the shorter ones that require recall should be answered much quicker. And of course, in any preparation, there must be practice sessions, especially with question three, where you are required to apply the majority of your knowledge of physical geography into the topographical map and of the photo map. So let's look at some closer strategies. My suggestion to you is, because it's three questions of a total of three hours, you should be spending at least 60 minutes per question. However, I would suggest that you take 55 minutes per question. Note, that simply means answering question one in 55 minutes, answering question two in 55 minutes, answering question three in 55 minutes. What does this do for you? Let's look at this closely. So, remember, before any examination, you are given 10 minutes of reading time. So for this three-hour examination, before the commencement, before the start of this examination, you have 10 minutes to read through your question papers. What have we suggested? Once the examination begins, you should be answering all three questions in two hours and 45 minutes. So that leaves me with a balance of 15 minutes. Those 15 minutes should be utilized to read and ensure that you've answered all questions, that you've responded adequately to your longer questions, that you haven't made any mistakes in following instructions adequately, and ensuring that you have answered all questions adequately. Reading time at the end is vitally important, especially where, especially where you have forgotten some questions, which would afford you losing marks unnecessarily. So what are we saying? Utilize the 10 minutes before the examination for reading the entire question paper. Two hours and 45 minutes to answer the entire question paper of the three hours. And allocating yourself five minutes per question, a total of 15 minutes at the end in order to read all your responses and ensure your writing is legible and you've answered all your questions adequately. That's a good strategy to follow in order to make sure when you walk out of the examination room, you have done justice to this examination. So let's take a closer look at what kind of questions there are in this examination. Remember in any examination that you write, especially in your geography examination, it is about examining your ability to reason. It is about examining your ability to think and remember. Now we call these the cognitive levels of the examination. There has to be in any examination easy questions, application questions, as well as those difficult questions that make you think a lot harder. We call these the three levels of cognition. Let's look at them closely. So your first level is those easy questions, that which you studied and should easily remember. 25% of the total 150 marks is made up of recalling or remembering. So going over your concepts, identifying key words for each of those concepts, being able to identify labels on a diagram. This is pure recall or remembering information. So remember, the easy questions make up 25% of the total 150 marks. What does this mean? It simply means that you should be able to score these marks that much easily, of course, if you've prepared adequately. The next type of questions is what we call the application of geographical knowledge. Those questions that require you to reason using different types of resources. Now, pay careful attention. In geography, we have a variety of resources. 
resources, which we will discuss later on in the show. But what's important is you must be able to recognize, yes, recognize the different content areas in the phenomena on those diagrams. These could be in the form of diagrammatic representations, graphical information, infographical information, maybe even extracts of newspaper articles. But how you are able to gather all your studying and put it together and answer those questions and respond adequately is what we call application type questions. 50% of this examination, 75 marks out of the 150, is made up of application. So what are we establishing? Whilst it's good for you to remember all your work, important in this examination is the application of that knowledge using a variety of resources. And what you should be doing is going over as many past year examinations to familiarize yourself with the different ways in which questions are asked. The last type of question, and those that separate those that have studied from those that have not, is what we call the high order questions. 25% of this examination is made up of higher order questions. This requires you to simply go beyond those resources, go beyond remembering, and now move into an evaluation mode, move into a suggestion mode, the kinds of comparisons and recognitions that are required, making judgments, looking at various different geographical phenomena and determining what works best. So this is about the geographical information that you have and how you've interpreted and how you are able to respond to it. Essentially, it's what we call the geographical perspective your ability to identify causes, your ability to identify effects, as well as solutions. Causes, effects, and solutions. These are what we call the high-order thinking skills that you will require to get to that distinction. Make sure that your abilities of experiential knowledge, that which is happening around you, is well-equipped. Because beyond the resources and beyond recalling is your ability to respond to phenomena with your experiential knowledge. That means simply how much do you know about what's going on around you. So now let's look at a closer look at the types of questions that we will have in this examination. Remember, in any examination, there is a structure as well as a format. So we've discussed the structure. Now, when it comes to the format in any examination, there are specific types of questions. These come in the form of the following. Short item questions. For example, multiple choice questions. Maybe even true and false. Matching column A with column B. Even selecting a word within brackets. So this is where your 25% usually comes from. It is about recalling and using the different ways in which short questions are asked to, uh, to put in that which you remember. Simply, in order to score the maximum marks here, follow the instructions. Ensure that your knowledge of remembering all those concepts is well within your range. The next type of question is what we call a data response question. Now, these kinds of questions require the use of multiple resources. These come in a variety of forms. For example, an extract from a newspaper article or a journal, maybe even a cartoon, as well as diagrams, statistical information, graphical information, and what's a common trend, infographics, the combination of a variety of resources testing one particular aspect of your geographical content. And of course, there's paragraph questions. Now, when it comes to paragraph questions, these are your longer type questions, usually from the middle of application to the higher order type of questioning techniques. Here, sentences are required. In geography, you are usually asked to write a paragraph of approximately eight lines. Ensure you maximize the usage of those eight lines. Remember, you cannot be penalized for exceeding those eight lines, but don't exceed them by too many. It's only eight lines, which means that four points are required. Usually, the mark scheme on your paragraph writing is four times two. Four clearly identified points, which are written in full sentences without the use of bullets in order to score the maximum eight marks. 
With that, we're going to take a break right now. But whilst you're preparing, remember, when you come back, we will discuss these three items in detail. With that, see you soon. Welcome back, geography learners. We are today giving you an exam guideline overview of Geography Paper 1. We've just discussed the types of questions in the examination. Remember, as we've just discussed before the break, there are three types. Short item questions, data response questions, as well as paragraph questions. Let's look at examples of the following. So, multiple choice questions, remember, occur in every examination, be it physical science, mathematics, life sciences, as well as geography. And what's unique is that it appears in both your theory as well as your map work. So, understanding how multiple choice questions works is crucial to success in this examination. So, what you should note is the following. Remember, the examination of multiple choice questions starts off with a statement, what we call the stem. The stem is usually a lead, lead to the options that are given as A, B, C, or D. Now, normally you will have four options, A, B, C, and D, to choose from. Remember that those options normally complete the sentence as it is indicated in this example. Usually, one of those options is what we call a distractor. That means something that will change it and does not apply to the stem. In this particular example, the waterfall is a fluvial landform developed from the process of. Now remember, when it comes to fluvial processes, there's only three. So what you should be noting, yes, deposition, transportation, or erosion. So immediately my mind is reasoning that there's only three answers that are applicable. Denudation is a distractor. I hope you were able to identify that. Now, I will have to use my geograph geographical knowledge as well as remember the fluvial landform, the waterfall. And immediately, I should be associating the waterfall with erosion. Remember that the waterfall is not as a result of transportation or deposition, but erosion. My correct answer is C. Always in the examination, you are required to write only the letter and not the word. So take careful note of that. Another example of a multiple choice question is where the reasoning of your abilities has been tested at a much higher level. This is what we call the level two type of multiple choice question. Here, let's look at the example. The Kalahari high pressure system is associated with one option, circulation, and is semi-permanent in. Notice the multiple ways in which multiple choice questions are being asked. So here there's two answers. Again, you're given the options of A, B, C, and D. Now, let's look at your reasoning skills. We're dealing with a high pressure system. Let's look for distractors. Immediately, I should know that if it's referring to clockwise, these distractors are out. So that means that a high-pressure system is anti-clockwise, isn't that so, in the southern hemisphere. So my only two options can be either B or D. Now, when I'm looking at the circulation pattern of a high-pressure system, what do I know? In the southern hemisphere, that circulation pattern is during which season? Yes, but notice how the word semi-permanent is used. So. I know that the Kalahari High dominates in winter, so it's less dominating in summer, meaning semi-permanent. So I'm looking for the answer anti-clockwise as well as summer. There's my correct answer, B. Notice your reasoning ability has to be there in order for you to successfully answer all your multiple choice questions. Take note, read the stem, firstly, Identify which is your distractors by looking at the content being examined and that would help you to quickly be able to recognize which is the correct answer. Moving on, now we're looking at data response questions. What kind of data response questions do we have? 
Remember, there's a variety of resources that are used in data response questions, especially in geography. Maps, graphical, statistical, or even infographical information. Remember, when we're talking to infographics, it is a combination of various types of resources. Extracts, usually newspaper articles discussing phenomena around the world or even in South Africa related to your physical geography content. Cartoons, these are very, very easy to find. Something that is, has a geographical aspect to it in the form of a cartoon is usually examined, not only in Geography Paper 2, but also in Geography Paper 1, as well as case studies. These are usually found especially in secondary circulations as well as catchment and river management. So familiarize yourself with case studies because they provide a wealth of information and allow the testing to go through levels one, two, and three. That's easy questions, application questions, as well as higher order questions. Also, we've got an example of a graph. So how do I analyze graphical information? Remember, when it comes to graphs, you have an axis, which we call the y-axis, as well as the x-axis. Very important. The first thing that you need to do when analyzing a graph is look at the graph or the chart title. The title tells you what is being the trend allocated within the graph. You normally have a value on your y-axis, and you normally have a value in your x-axis. Between that, you have the graph, which then shows you the trend of that particular phenomenon. Graphical information is usually examined by asking you the trends of the graph. What is the trend of a graph? It is the relationship between the y-axis and the x-axis. So usually, a question of what is the trend of the graph simply means why does the graph line behave in a certain way? You must be able to discuss that relationship between the x-axis value and the y-axis value. Of course, the third type of question is your paragraph writing questions. Now, these are usually reserved for application as well as your high-order questions. Here's a few tips, hints and tips on what you should be doing with paragraph questions. The first aspect is to ensure that you understand the instructional verbs. Using verbs in a question is important because it tells me what kind of action I need to perform. Example, do I need to explain? Do I need to discuss? Or, from a geographical perspective, should I be suggesting and drawing up from my own knowledge and making a judgment? So identifying the instructional verb in your paragraph question or the verb is very important. Why? It tells me the type of response I will be writing. The next aspect is ensuring that you write in full sentences. Now in paragraph writing, remember, there is no use of bullets. You cannot bullet or dash every point. You have to ensure that there's a continuous flow for each and every point. Paragraph questions are allocated four marks. So, four times four points. So four times two is equal to eight. For every point that you write, there are two marks allocated. So crucial is writing full sentences and ensuring you have a minimum of four valid points. You can write more, but remember the maximum credit will be given for four points. Usually you write more if you're uncertain about the sum of some of those points that you've written. Now remember, in your paragraph question, you have what we call an impact analysis. When you see the word, suggest the impact, explain the impact. Remember that it is asking for both the positive and negative impacts. Unless it is stipulated or asked in the question, that means that state the positive impacts, explain the negative impacts, discuss the positive and negative impacts. Without a specification, you are required to identify and respond to both positive as well as negative impacts. The other aspect that you should consider when writing paragraph questions is analyzing relationships. So in your sentences, there must be a clear distinction with the use of the words increasing or decreasing. For example, 
Remember that an increase in temperature results in a decrease in pressure. This is a relationship. Dependent on the way the questions are structured, you always should be talking to relationships using those crucial words of increasing as well as decreasing. Sometimes a phenomena may show an increase as well as an increase or a decrease as well as a decrease. Identifying these core relationships is crucial in order for you to score the maximum marks. This is but paragraph questions. Preparing for them, the best way to do so is by referring to previous examinations and looking at the ways paragraph questions are being asked. What type of instructional verbs are being used? What type of relationships are required? Is it an impact assessment? And in Geography Paper 1, environmental impact assessments are crucial. And always remember, write in full sentences. So with that, we've come to another ad break. I'm going to now talk to the content that is examinable from your CAPS documents in Geography Paper 1. So what I suggest you do is get your geography notebooks out and use the next session as a checklist in order for you to ensure that you've prepared adequately. See you soon. Welcome back, Grade 12s. We're just about to begin the next part of our session of exam guideline review for Geography Paper 1. So, have your paper and pen ready to ensure that you list all these topics so that when you're preparing for this examination, all these topics are adequately covered. We will be identifying from your exam guidelines and CAPS documents the necessary topics. So let's start with question one in your geography paper one. Climate and weather. What are the topics that are required? Firstly, mid-latitude cyclones. Remember, in mid-latitude cyclones, it is made up of a secondary circulation, as well as tropical cyclones two secondary circulations that are examined in correct question one. However, note that whilst these are big sections in the examinations, they can be examined in both your short as well as your long item questions. The next topic, subtropical anticyclones. These are your high pressure systems. Valley climates, remember, anabatic and catabatic winds. Urban climates, mostly focusing on, yes, the urban heat island, as well as pollution domes. And of course, synoptic weather maps. Synoptic weather maps are a broader aspect of climate and weather that tends to integrate all your geographical climate and weather knowledge. Let's look closely at the requirements of each of these topics. So for mid-latitude cyclones, what should I know? In any weather phenomenon, general characteristics is very important. When we're talking about characteristics, remember, we are describing the weather phenomenon. That means, when you look at it, what do you see? Do you see a low pressure system? Do you see fronts, a cold and warm front? You know what I'm talking about. So general characteristics. When you're looking at your notes or your textbooks, remember general characteristics is a first subtopic under the topic mid-latitude cyclones. Generally, you should be remembering all the characteristics of a mid-latitude cyclone. Areas where mid-latitude cyclones form. Usually, you will be using a map, especially a synoptic weather map, to identify the geographic location of a mid-latitude cyclone. And of course, when weather phenomena are studied, conditions necessary for their formation is crucial. Stages of development is another aspect that's important. Remember with your mid-latitude cyclones, we're talking to four clearly distinguished stages. Do you know them? I do. You should be mentioning them now. Correct. Remember, don't confuse the tropical cyclone stages with the mid-latitude stages. What I'm going to suggest is, Dependent on which textbook you are using, some textbooks identify three, four, or five stages. Most importantly, be able to describe what happens in those stages. 
especially your mature stage with the development of the cold and the warm fronts. So what am I saying? When it comes to mid-latitude cyclones, different writers see the different stages of the mid-latitude cyclone. Some textbooks have three, some have four, and some have five. Depending on what you've learned, what's most important is the characteristics of each stage. Remember, we will define it according to the descriptions on the diagram. Very important for you to remember, as well as those related weather conditions. Remember, depending on the type of cloud associated with the stage of development, that will determine the type of weather associated. And usually when you see cumulonimbus clouds, you should be preparing for torrential rainfall as well as gale force winds. The weather patterns associated with the cold, warm, and occluded fronts. There are various different types of weather, specifically cloud formations that are associated with each type of front. Knowing the difference between the cold and the warm front, which sectors are occurring during each stage, as well as the difference between a warm occlusion as well as a cold occlusion will help you better prepare for mid-latitude cyclones. Of course, in this particular example, the reading and interpreting of satellite images as well as synoptic weather maps is crucial for you to bring together your knowledge. The next aspect is a tropical cyclone. Are you completing your checklists? Like a mid-latitude cyclone, general characteristics, and as we've discussed, descriptions, knowing how to describe the various aspects of this geographical phenomenon. Areas where tropical cyclones occur, the factors necessary for the formation. Are you noticing a parallel between what we've done in mid-latitude as well as tropical? A good idea for your study purposes is to draw a table with one column, mid-latitude, the other tropical, write these headings down and compare the both of them. Again, stages of development, associated weather conditions. Again, the cumulonimbus cloud, the cloud responsible for torrential rainfall and gale force winds. Correct, during the mature stage knowing full well the differences between the weather conditions in the eye as well as outside the eye wall. These are critical aspects that you must be able to respond to. Also in this examination, when it comes to tropical cyclone, your preparation requires you to ensure that you've read and understood the location, the geographic location, on satellite images as well as synoptic weather maps. A common occurrence is the examining of case studies for tropical cyclones. Since the year 1984 with tropical cyclone Des Moines to the year 2000, tropical cyclone Eileen, right up until the past two years where we've had tropical cyclone Ida as well as tropical cyclone Eloise in 2021. Irrespective of which tropical cyclone it is, you should be understanding the intensity and how weather conditions prevail during this weather phenomenon. Of course, impacts on human activities as well as, as, well as strategies to manage the effects of those weather conditions is important when it comes to tropical cyclones. Moving on, your subtropical anticyclones. Now, these are the three high pressure systems that dominate the weather across South Africa. You know what I'm talking about. Correct. The South Atlantic, the South Indian, and the Kalahari high pressure systems, all occurring along the 30, 0 to 30 degree latitude. What should we be knowing? The location of these three high pressure systems. And like their name suggests, your South Atlantic high, correct, over the Atlantic Ocean. Your South Indian high, over the Indian Ocean, and of course your Kalahari High, which we've already established in this session, is the high pressure system that dominates the interior, especially the interior of South Africa around the areas of the Free State as well as Gauteng. It is responsible for the dry, frosted conditions that occur in winter. Yes, the tropical anticyclone, the Kalahari High. General characteristics again, and its influence on weather and climate. Are you seeing a pattern emerging about how we're analyzing weather and climate in terms of its characteristics, in terms of its weather conditions? 
anticyclonic air circulation and associated disturbances. With anticyclones comes your understanding of cyclones. Because when these two phenomena, weather phenomena, interact with each other, they're responsible for prevailing weather conditions throughout South Africa. For example, a moisture front. A moisture front is formed due to the high pressure systems as well as the convergence of air to a low pressure trough over the interior. The line thunderstorm, that low pressure trough that generates thunderstorm activities along a trough line in the interior. Coastal low pressure systems. These are low pressure systems that move from west to east along the coastline of South Africa. That simply means that it is interacting with a high pressure system. Generally, your South Atlantic, South Indian and Kalahari High feeds in air along the coast in the coastal low. And of course, your South African berg winds. Now, this is only with your Kalahari High and your coastal low. So all that air in the interior feeds into the coastal low, creating what we call the South African berg wind, a very unique wind occurring in South Africa. And again, reading and interpreting of synoptic weather maps. Can you see how these different weather phenomena come together for us to understand on a synoptic weather map? So in preparation for your studies, make sure that you are analyzing different synoptic weather maps that your teachers have given you. This is in order to adequately prepare for both tropical and mid-latitude cyclones, as well as your anticyclones. Our next section is valley climates and urban climates. Now remember, these are what we call localized or microclimates. Part of your understanding of climate and weather requires you to ensure that you understand at a regional scale your mid-latitude and tropical cyclones and at a very local or microclimatic range valley climates and urban climates. When it comes to valley climates, what are we supposed to know? We are supposed to know the microclimate of a valley. Now what you should be noting is that especially when it comes to microclimates, these can be integrated into topographical maps. Using contour lines, do you have the ability to identify a slope? Is it a steep slope? What type of air is blowing down that steep slope at night? Of course, it's a catabatic wind, and during the day, an anabatic wind. So the effect of slope aspect is also important. This simply is the relation of a slope to the sun. Simply, in the southern hemisphere, the north-facing slope receives more sunlight than the south-facing slope. This means that more vegetation should be planted on a north-facing slope. Remember, when it comes to slope aspects, we are talking to the angle at which the sun rays strike a slope in a specific hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, you have the direct rays on the north-facing slope. We're also understanding the development of anabatic and catabatic winds. What are we talking to? We are calling day and night winds. Your day winds are your anabatic winds, and your night winds are your catabatic winds. And the influence of local climates. Here we look at localized conditions, as such as radiation fog, mist, fog. These are formations that occur in a specific area due to climatic and weather conditions prevailing in that specific area. From your grade 10 and 11 content, you should be noting that evaporation and condensation become very important concepts, especially in grade 12, once you've understood them in grade 10. Let's take a closer look at your urban climate. In urban climate, we need to understand the reasons for the differences between rural and urban climates. Now, remember your urban climates are your built up areas and your rural areas are your wide open spaces, usually associated with vegetation. Is there a difference between the way in which the temperatures exist? Of course there is. This is what we call the urban versus rural climate. Specific to the urban climate is the urban heat island, a localized area within the urban area that has a higher temperature than its surrounding area. So when it comes to the urban heat island, we are now studying the propensity for higher heat values within the CBD or your central business district or your city as compared to the areas around. What factors, what causes 
and effects occur. Can you see the geographical perspective of causes and effects? We also study the pollution dome. Now, because of the types of activities that occur within the city, generating heat, we have what we call a pollution dome. The pollution dome is a concentration of pollution that is generated in the city. How does this pollution come to the city? Of course, it is the motor vehicles that enter the city. It is the daily activities within the city. It is the artificial air conditioning. It is all those chimneys that release heat from the kitchens in those restaurants within the city. Because of all these heat generating actions, a pollution dome occurs. What you should be noting is that pollution dome is a permanent feature within a city. However, what are we looking at? We are looking at its concentration during the day and night. Obviously, because of the higher temperatures during the day, the pollution dome is less concentrated. At night, because of the lower temperatures and all the sinking air towards the surface, the pollution dome is more concentrated. What we should also be concentrating on in our studies is the strategies that are used to reduce the heat island effect. What kind of strategies is a city like Johannesburg, Cape Town, or Durban employing to reduce its high temperatures? Creating green belts, ensuring that there's parks and gardens around the city, ensuring that the city is not a haven for just concrete, glass, and tar, which is normally the artificial surfaces, but ensuring that there are greeneries and vegetation around the city also to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that is present within the city. Of course, geomorphology is very important as well. The topics that we'll be looking at is drainage basins, fluvial processes, and catchment and river management. Let's take a closer look. When it comes to your drainage systems, remember your concepts. Drainage basins, catchment area, river systems, watershed, tributary, source, mouth, confluence, water table, surface runoff, as well as the groundwater. Remember, the mouth is the end of the river where it enters into the ocean. The source is where the river starts. Also, you should be looking at types of rivers. Remember, permanent, periodic, episodic, as well as exotic rivers. Know them in terms of the water table. Drainage patterns, usually, dendritic and trellis if you've been studying previous exam papers. Drainage density, comparing the difference between high and low densities, as well as stream orders on topographic maps, which is used in question three. Of course, in the drainage system, you must know the discharge of a river system. Looking at fluvial processes, what subtopics should you be preparing on? Of course, in this particular aspect, we're looking at the river profiles the different views of a river, from a cross profile, which is the front view, to the longitudinal profile, which is the side view. Remember the stages of a river. Middle, no, let's start at the top. The upper course, the middle course, as well as the lower course. What kind of fluvial landforms? Is your checklist guy having all these topics? Meanders, oxbow lakes, braided streams, floodplains, a natural levee, waterfalls, rapids, and deltas. When it comes to fluvial landforms, please note this down. You must be able to identify and describe these landforms in various different resources. Of course, river grading is important as a part of fluvial processes. Rejuvenation, river capture. In most examinations, river capture forms an integral part of examining. So, understand river capture, understand the two ways in which river captures occurs. Remember that there's an abstraction as well as when a stream flowing at a lower level captures the stream flowing at a higher level. Of course, superimposed and antecedent drainage is important and recognizing them on diagrams as well as a variety of resources is important. When it comes to catchment and river management, here we're looking at a case study. Usually, a river in South Africa that has been polluted. What should we know? We should know the importance of managing drainage basins as a catchment area. The impact of people on drainage basins and catchment, as well as a case study. So, 
What should I be noting? There's various different rivers around South Africa. And along with these rivers comes the aspect of pollution, poor management, especially by municipalities. Like the Val River in Gauteng, what about the Amgeni River in KZN? There's various rivers, rivers that have not been managed adequately. And as a result, increased water shortages are occurring throughout the country. What is the topic in geography? Catchment and river management. What you should be doing is looking at it from a geography perspective, a geographical perspective. Causes, effects, and solutions. Usually a case study. That means one of the rivers in South Africa and how human beings have impacted, how municipalities have neglected. This is important for you to offer solutions, cleanup campaigns, educating those living around it. Very important, catchment and river management. And of course, in the geography examination, question three, which is your geographical skills and techniques? But we're gonna save that for a later episode. I hope that this broad overview is helping you prepare adequately for this examination. By mentioning these topics from the CAPS documents as well as the exam guidelines, you are now better prepared to know what you need to know before you write that examination. So with that, guys, good luck for your examination. I hope we've helped you today.